was just another uh, continuation from yesterday. Yesterday, I had uh, had this up there. We were going to talk about group work today. It's a bit of a nebulous topic. It feels very artificial um, without actually practicing and trying it out. But I'm going to just talk about what we're expecting from the group work in this course. Um, as you know, groups apply are mandatory for this course. If you're um, can you ask Jerry? No, sorry. Uh, Okay, for A1 or two. I'm not sure what it is. So, groups of five are mandatory for this course. Uh, we're going to put you in groups of five, and if there's 93 in the class, there'll be another group of three or so. But definitely, everyone is going to be in a group of five, and you'll be doing all your assignments and tutorials in groups, and then, of course, the major project. So, being able to function as a group and, and understanding what group norms are about, being a good chairperson, the chairperson's role will rotate every week. Um, and, and learning those skills are fundamental to what this course is trying to achieve. So let's talk a bit about what this SDL, self-directed learning project, is about. So self-directed learning, anything that you've done recently. This summer I learned how to write a board site, which was something I never thought I would ever do, but it was, it was fun. Anything that you've learned that you've never been taught by your parents, never been taught at any school or university. Yeah. Water skiing. Sorry, water skiing. <laughs> Something that you've had to, that you've identified a need for and you've gone and figured it out, whether you did it for pleasure or whether you did it for work. Uh, yeah. Playing piano. Nice. Water rafting. Water rafting, lots of sports, lots of recreation. Scuba diving. Scuba diving. Anything someone did this summer that, that you learned that was new, something that you learned in a co-op term that you had to figure out? So you built your own computer? Nice. Spanish? Sorry. Spanish? Spanish? Learning Spanish? Yeah. Nice. Okay, so if I look back over the past uh, five, ten years, these are some things that I've learned myself. Um, some, not all of them, but this one. I uh, figured out how to fix drywall in my house, change batteries and oil in my car, fix plumbing, much cheaper than paying $300 to call a plumber out on a Sunday night if you can figure it out yourself. Uh, maybe learn how to cook an egg dish that you have not normally cooked before. Uh, you learn something during the co-op term that you needed to, to, to do to, to accomplish some, some goal in your co-op. Uh, Maybe you figure out, uh, certainly in the next two, three, five years, you may go through the process of buying a car, definitely, or a house, maybe. You may want to decide to grow your own food, just as a hobby. Um, learning a new language, Spanish was mentioned. Um, yeah, I've had to learn Spanish as well for, for travel. And uh, my brother uh, is now fluent in Mandarin. So when I went to Taipei a few uh, months ago and visited him, there he is, this little blonde chap, he can put Mandarin on the streets of people and it freaks them out. But he did it for, he's been there for four or five years and he did it for work and he's still working and he had his first job interview in Mandarin and, and uh, that was his goal to, to achieve that. So, so learning a language is definitely something that you have to do on your own and you've identified a need for it, a shortcoming, and you go through a process of achieving that goal. Um, maybe starting your own company, something you want to give a go. Or even just something as simple as figuring out whether it's better to buy a new car versus a new car. That's something you could do after the, uh, we look at the process economics section over the next few weeks. And in fact, the tutorial on Monday will be totally on personal finances. Um, and it will be totally self-directed. We have not obviously covered any material in this course. But that first tutorial, by the end of the Monday, you'll have to hand in something that on personal finance. We'll learn about RRSPs, tax free savings accounts, investing in the stock market. These are important financial topics that you need to have to be able to live as a person in society and, it's, and how you go about figuring those out. Maybe some of you already know a bit about it, but many of you don't. And so you'll learn all about that on Monday in the tutorial. And it will be up to you to use your, your mobile device, go to the library, speak to other people in the class, to help figure out the answers to the questions in that tutorial. So that's a good example of self-directed learning that you're going to see the very first in this course. Now, self-directed learning is important for a large number of reasons, but I'd like to just put on here one 
one slide that focuses on my reasons for, for self-directed learning. You have to realize that the days of an employee-employee for life are over. So um, you may have heard, maybe not your parents' generation, but certainly your grandparents' generation, it's fairly common for people to stay and work for one company their whole lives. My father has gone through maybe two, three jobs his whole life. And that's uh, quite normal. But then for people of my age and then people of generations younger than me, five, six, seven, ten jobs is quite common. So you'll always be moving around from employer to employer. At the, the very least to upgrade your skills and more selfishly just to get a raise. Most companies, if you stay with them for any number of years, you don't move up very fast. If you want a raise, you move to another company and you play them off against each other. You, you raise your earning potential. So you will be moving around. But to move around, you have to prove that you have the skills to offer to that company. So more importantly for you guys, your first job is going to take a lot of work. You may have some leg in the door already from a co-op term. But if you haven't had a co-op term or, uh, you, or a co-op term with a company in an area you like to work in, you're going to have to work a little bit harder. There's going to be resumes and job hunts and job fairs that are coming up here late in September. You're going to have to prove to the company that you're the one that they want to fill that position. And you're going to have to show that you have some skills to, to meet those, uh, meet the company's needs. If you don't find a job, you can always start your own company. I want you to realize that is one option as well. You don't have to ever work for some big corporation. You can always start your own. Um, and it may not be something to do right away, but something you could do five, ten years from now. Work for a company for a few years and then give, give, give your own company a try. You're at the perfect age where you can make mistakes, lose money, fail, or succeed. So it's a no-risk time to, to give that a go. Um, when you get 35, 40 years old, and you have a partner, you have kids, you have a spouse and family, then it's a lot harder to decide to start your company. But now you've got that freedom, so bear that in mind. But here's where self-directed learning comes in. You will likely be a contract-based employee for the next few years of your life. No company often tends to offer longer-term permanent employment. Uh, even myself, I'm on a three-year contract with Mac, starting this July. And then they can choose to renew it or not in three years from now. And then after that, if they renew it once, then I have to apply to be a permanent employee, and they may decide not to accept it. So I'm always at the mercy of my employer, as it were. If my skills stagnate, or I don't keep going and, and keep performing, they have no obligation to renew their contract. And many companies operate like that. Many, many companies operate like that no matter what your age. So you have to realize that you have to keep your skills up to date. And that doesn't mean just now when you start working, but also while you're working. When you're 45, 50, you're planning to maybe retire when you're 60, 65, whatever the age that you may not be planning is yet, obviously. But when you're 45, it's very tempting just to say, well, I've got a good job as a manager. There's another 15 years ahead of me in this company. I can just keep doing what I do, and I'll be fine. Um, I met a guy at Glasses with Klein. He came back to me in October, and he had just gotten notice that he was not going to have his contract renewed in December. And he told me his biggest regret was he'd been working for 20 years in the pharmaceutical industry in the role of validation, and he had not upgraded any of his skills. He said, I just I just messed around, just did whatever they asked me to do. But for those 20 years, he had not gone on extra courses, he had not kept his skills up to date. And he got a one-year contract at GSK. GSK realized, you know, this guy's skills are 10 years out of date, at least. And he's 55, still wants to, and needs to work in order to pay for his pension for another five to 10 years. But Here's an employee who's saying, we hired you for one year, you couldn't deliver. So he has to try another company. And another company is also going to do the same thing until he keeps his skills up to date. And he told me that that was his biggest regret, was not keeping himself up to date. Okay? You have to keep learning. And this is not going to be the last time you learn. When you finish your final exams here, maybe one of the last exams that you write, but it's not going to be the last time that you learn. And learn to keep your skills up. So self-directed learning and being able and capable 
of picking up new skills on your own is fundamental to being successful in the future. Okay, so that to me is why we want to emphasize this in the course. Obviously the, the course outline requires me to teach these sorts of things, but there's a, there's a stronger reason than that why we want to, to succeed as an engineer. Or, as I said, then, you, may, you may not even stay in engineering. As I, as I mentioned yesterday, there's any number of roles that engineers tend to work in that they're very, very capable of. Okay, so with that as the background, what you're going to be doing in this course to help learn these skills of self-directed learning are a number of assignments and tutorials, for example, like the one on personal finance tomorrow, uh, Monday, where you're going to have to go out of your way and learn some new, some new ideas and new concepts of your own. But the strongest component of self-directed learning is, of course, the project that you're doing in your groups. And this project is going to require you to go find a flow sheet of a unit, of several units in a company. Uh, of, of, okay, so go to, you, can, you have several options. One is you can go to a company and get their flow sheet. So for example, the malaic and hydride process or a wastewater treatment plant. What's not appropriate is Suncor in Sanya. That, that's too, too large a scope. But what's not appropriate either is just a distillation column in the petrochemical plant. That's too small a scope. So we're maybe looking at something of a number of processing units, five to 10 processing units, reactors, separators, mixing tanks, pumps, and so on, that form a coherent part of a chemical process. You can either go find that process based on your contacts from your co-op firms, you may work in a group where someone in your group has, had, has a contact with you. Or maybe one of your parents work in a company where that sort of process is accessible and available to you. Or at the last resort, you could use the literature and identify a flow sheet and use that as your basis. And simulate it in HISIS or Aspen, or use data from the literature, from encyclopedias, from Perry's handbook, and so on to come up with a coherent process. Now there are a number of examples of companies you could go to around this area. Um, there's wastewater treatment plants all over the GTA. There's Cadbury's out here just by Latinos. There's a Malay and hydride plant where we have McMaster graduates. There's GE Membranes. Um, and there's a number of other companies and I'll get, I'll get a list together from the co-op office here. And I'll have a more coherent write-up on the project and what the scope is later on. But that's, in a nutshell, what, what we're looking at. So you and your group will be identifying a process of interest that the whole group has agreed on. That's the first step. Then you'll be looking at the economics of that process, how much it would cost to build a process of that type, capital costs. You'll be looking at operation issues, how that process is started up, how it's operated day to day and shut down. In particular, you will look at the safety issues a hazard and alphabetic study at a minimum will be required there. And you'll look at troubleshooting issues around the process. If you're working with a company, then they identify particular problems that show up and how you could go about troubleshooting that. And then finally, there's a component after you've submitted uh, where you summarize your learning and you reflect on what your group has learned. And that's, that's an important part of the self-directed learning processes. Coming back and figuring out what worked, what didn't work, what I would do different next time. So you evaluate yourselves in that reflection on what was learned. So that's, it, that's the project that we're going to be using as a, as a way to, to teach you self-directed learning. And a lot of this you're going to do on your, on your own with your group, but the TAs and myself are there to assist you. So we met Yasser and Alicia yesterday. They've got good experience with companies previously. I have some experience as well. And we're going to guide you through, through this process where, where, where there's need for it. But mostly, we're going to rely on you and your group to learn your way through and complete this project. So to recognize then, self-directed learning is a process where first you identify what you already do know. And you've learned a number of interesting unit operations in chemical engineering already. So you know quite a bit about many of the flow sheets that, might, that you might pick as a, as a group. Then you have to realize and recognize why you have shortcomings. So 
Well, you may not have the flow rates that go through the flow sheet. You may not have the temperatures and pressures at which some of those units operate. You may not have idea about the safety issues with regards to their process and how the process should be instrumented for safe operation. So these are gaps in your knowledge that you have to diagnose. The group will help you with that. And you're going to have to see, well, what resources could I use to figure out these shortcomings? It may be as simple as a Google search, or it might be more comprehensive where you go search and then get journal publications, which you can see online, or it might be books, encyclopedias that are only available in terms of the library. You might need to meet with people, and by people it's myself, the TAs, it might be other professors, other chemical engineering students, or you may actually find that within your group you have um, some knowledge already where you, that you can draw on. In, in general, I put that you could attend conferences, or that's not the expectation for this course. And then you may need to phone up people outside that master that actually work in these types of companies and ask for informational interviews, maybe a phone call or an hour-long conference call with a company that does wastewater treatment or makes a particular chemical or so any, any number of ways in which to identify, uh, to, to achieve that gap in the knowledge, or to close that gap in the knowledge, I should say. And then you come around at the end and you evaluate what worked, what didn't, and maybe you need to start over again with, with some of those processes. So the key point about self-directed learning, it's a procedure, and that's why we want to teach you in this course. It's not, just a, it's not just a small, simple technique. It's a whole process that you have to go through in order to now, there's a few things that SDL is not. One is, it's not meaning to sit back and do nothing. There will be a period of time near the end of the class, of the end of the semester, where there are no classes. There, that, that is intentional. It's, that time is created then for you and your group to start wrapping up your project and working on the real report of it. So there will be a period of about a week and a half where there are no classes, maybe even two weeks in November. Um, SDL is not where you go and say, I'm just going to look at one, one way of doing this, or one hypothesis. You should seek out multiple options. Um, there, there's always more than one way to, to design a process or a flow sheet. So you may work with a company, and they all have a particular flow sheet for, let's say, Malaik and Highguide, but there could be an alternative. And you can certainly investigate that alternative in your project as well. Um, you're, not going to, you're going to learn that you won't get your answers always the first time. Um, you're not always going to succeed either. But what we want is you to document how you've done it and, and, and document why it's not worked out the way you intended it. And to realize that your group members are not competing against you. Okay? What we want you to do is to move from just being a group of five people to being a team where you work together. That's an important skill to learn as well. Okay, so as I, as I mentioned, the TAs and myself will definitely be supporting you in this role. You will be having review meetings with us where you come with a formal agenda and 30 to 45 minutes where you and your group will meet with myself or the TAs and you will receive guidance from us about the process that you've gone through so far. And we will be using those meetings to evaluate you. So we'll be evaluating you based on your chairman skills, about how the group dynamics are working, about the group performance overall and how you're going about self-directed learning. So we will be working with, and this is where I mentioned yesterday, is that manager-colleague relationship, where we're working you at that level. It's not an instructor-student relationship. We may be able to help you to refer you elsewhere, depending on the nature of your project. You may have some experience. I don't know every chemical flow sheet. Definitely not. There's, there's a number of processes that I'm very ignorant of, and so I'll be learning as well with you guys. So, but where I am able to help and refer you to other resources, I definitely will consider as well. Okay. Any questions on that so far before we just move in talking about group dynamics and group work? Any, any concerns about the project and about the structure of it?
not even a chemical process. We had three three-inch binders filled with safety information. Mm -hmm. So when I'm referring to safety here, it's you're going to be looking at documenting what safety would be required for a process. So what considerations in terms of instrumentation and in terms of pressure relief or venting are required to operate this process in a safe way. So we need instrumentation for it. We also have to include that. So everything that ran on air yards, we had two pumps where one is not able to keep up another one. Goes exactly. And we'll learn about that in the safety section. So it's not that uh, you're going to be totally in the dark yet. Yeah. Uh, this is we have to I'll be we have to be recognized that this isn't entirely self-directed. Uh, it's not like I'm giving you the project today and then leaving you to it and then we come back a few months later. We're going to be learning about the process and economics, we're going to be learning about safety, we're going to be learning about troubleshooting and operability while you're doing this project. Okay, so we'll be learning about, for example, redundancies in terms of instrumentation, as you just mentioned. So that, that will give you some help there while, while we're going through this project. So there's a lot going on in parallel here with this course. The project is, I'm setting the scene right now, so you have it in your head why we're learning the material as we're going through through the next few weeks. Yes. Uh, online, it only gave you three um, blanks to fill out names. So okay, yeah, we'll cool. come to the group members in a minute. Yeah, I'll yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so uh, I, I'll, get, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that shortly. So groups of five, as I mentioned, the idea here is that you magnify the strength amongst all your your group members. So one of you might be super creative, another one of you might be very technically inclined, another one of you has had a co-op term already and that's going to be your project because you've got some good in inside information on a flow sheet and some data and numbers to help you. The point is to draw on your strengths okay? and to form a group that you you think that you, can, you can achieve that goal. Um, we, we say here, and it's, and it's always true, that we're working groups after you graduate. Um, every company I've worked in, that's been, that's been the case. Uh, if you want to read, read a bit more about group work, uh, uh, the yellow book, Turton, is going to be now referenced on the course website. So you'll read through chapter 28, which talks about group work and teamwork. Um, but they, they make an interesting point there. In many companies where we work, we'll be working as a team. And if the team is, say, five to ten people, you may often be the only engineer on that team. So you may be working with someone from marketing, another person from finance, and you may often be the only engineer. And certainly if there are other engineers, you'll probably be the only chemical engineer in some instances. So it's really critical that you know your material well and you know what your area is about. And because then you can't rely on the other group members to contribute their knowledge of chemical engineering, they likely won't have any. So from that point of view, it's a little bit artificial what we have in this course because we're forming groups of five chemical engineers, but the skills you're going to learn from that group based learning are, are what we're trying to, to convey. Um, now you will hopefully not see this amongst your groups, but I've been told by previous instructors there's always two or three groups where this does happen. So we, we don't want to see this. If you get to a point like that, it's likely a symptom of that your group has decided to degrade in some way. And we're going to, in one of the next tutorials, discuss group norms. I'll talk a bit about what group norms are coming up shortly. But it's when you've decided that your group is going to operate in a particular way, and then two, three, five weeks later, you actually don't implement those decisions. So your group may have decided that if, if one of the persons away at a job interview, or is CSCHE or AICHE, that you're all going to pitch in and, and do that other person's work, or that person's work is going to be flipped over to someone else, and then when that person comes back, additional work will be flipped over to them. That may be your group norm decision that you come to an agreement next week. But when AICHE or CSCHE actually comes around and you don't implement that norm, then there's resentment. Because now someone has gone and enjoying the conference in Vancouver, but the other four of you are left picking up the pieces for that person's role. And there's a tutorial that's due that week, and that person's not here to help out. So then you get to those cases where you just want to cut each other's necks off. Um, 
poor attendance, and poor distribution of work, uh, we may find, and it likely will happen, that the group gets split three two. Three of you are buddies, the other two are buddies, and then there's a, a separation. How do you function and bring those two separate pieces together to form teams? Okay, or poor quality work, when you feel that one or more people's contribution isn't quite up to the same standard as you would have done. What are you going to do in, that, in those situations? So that's where the bad group dynamics come in. We hope that you don't experience that too much. Uh, Dr. Marlon has this slide always in his notes. What we want you to do is to go from a group of five people where you may or may not know each other quite well. So at, by the end of these three months, you form the team and have learned how to work together. So what we are trying to establish is that the group members are going to support each other. You're, you're, learn, you're all learning here how to do self-directed learning. You're, you're learning a new skill in this course. And you're going to support each other through that process. You're going to have to accommodate each other's schedules. Your group of five may not all live in Hamilton. You may be spread across all the way from the and Brampton down to Brantford. Well, it's going to be challenging to get that group together. It's not like a normal company where there's a nine to five and you're all expected to be in the same office area. Here you've got students with different agendas, different timetables, uh, different uh, ideas of what they want to do on the weekends or weeknights, and you're going to have to accommodate that. You're going to have to realize that the students, that the, sorry, the people in your group are, are a resource themselves and not for the time that is. So, let's talk a little bit uh, that we're going to select groups. And this is the process. Um, now, about 20 of you have done it already. Um, but on the website, so let's just take a look at that. If you go to the course website right now, um, over here in the top left is this mandatory questionnaire. So please pay careful attention. This questionnaire must be filled in by the end of today. Okay? The TAs and myself will use the result of that questionnaire over the weekend to try and formulate the as best we can. So please fill in that questionnaire online by the end of today. That is critical. And anyone who's not here in the class uh, that you're aware of, please inform them to do so. Okay? This questionnaire takes the following form. If you click on that link over there, you go to a website where you fill in, there's a bit about what this process is about, so please read that. After you click continue, <coughs> enter your name, student number, and these next few boxes here are telling me and the TAs a bit about yourself. My goal, and this might seem unusual, is to try and learn at least all your names after two weeks. So I usually get the names of all the students in my class by the final exam. When I walk around the final exam for my 4C or 3E or other courses I've taught, I can usually identify most of the faces and put a name to it. But that's because none of those courses have interaction with people. So it's really hard for me to get to learn all the names. Um, so this course, my goal is within the next two tutorial sessions is to figure out at least all your names. So it's, it's going to be tough for me, but, and the TAs are also going to give it a go, but we're, we're going to give it a try. But what we want to do to help us is we want to know just a bit more about yourself, about what you want to see and what you want to get out of this course, and what you're going to do after you finish in here. So do you have a job offer right now? What is your plan after April, even if you don't have a job offer? Something that you've learned that, that might be interesting. We want to understand a bit about your course load, so please check off which courses you're taking over there. And then the next part of this is, is going to help guide the group selection. So firstly I want to know which tutorial slot you're in, morning or afternoon. Okay, so I've got the list from Mugsy already that indicates what you've been registered as, but this is just for me to cross-reference that. Then I want to understand if you're willing to switch tutorial slots. Okay, so I found out from the administrators that I can switch people from morning to afternoon, but sometimes it's going to cause a clash. So if it's definitely going to cause a clash, please answer, definitely no, I don't want you to switch to another, to another tutorial slot. But if, you, if you're fluid, uh, you can click either the yes, you can switch, or I prefer not to, if you've chosen morning or afternoon for some other.
other reasons. But if you're flashy with another class, please pick that third option. This is going to be used to help form your group because your group of five must all attend the same tutorial slot. So we need this information for that purpose. Then this next question is for a last resort. If we cannot pair people up, we're going to try and at least pair them to be in the same interest. So if you're interested in polymers, wastewater treatment, um, I've just chosen the general streams that we tend to have here in the image. And then finally, the last question before going on here is you either pick I have no particular preference for a group, or you may have some sort of group, in which case you check the bottom one. So if you pick the first one, you have no preference, you won't see the next page that I'm going to show you now. You'll just go straight to the end of the section. And that's for people, I know there's some of you in the class who have um, you've come back from co-op terms after a long period of time and you don't actually know anyone in the class anymore, or you don't know too many other people in the class. So if you've got absolutely no preference where you work, choose the first, but most of you will likely go through the second one. And if you pick that, then you'll land up on a page that looks like this. You pick your three group members. And here you're picking them in order of preference. So this is the person you would most like to work with, then the next, and then the third. There's a reason why you can't pick all your group members. And that's because in practice in a company, you can never pick your entire group yourself. Okay. So instructors in this course have run it in the past in two different ways. They've either allowed total self-selection of groups of five, or they've done random allocation. So I feel both of them have some detracting elements to it. And I'm trying to strike a middle ground where you're selecting some of your group members, but not all of them. And then we're going to use some of that other software information based on timetabling and interests to try and form the groups of five. So you will not get an entire group of all your choices because we're only limiting you to picking three out of the other four members. But we're going to give you some measure of influence on what the grouping is. And we, we, we do reserve the discretion to form groups. Um, at, as a last resort, there may be some sort of randomized element to it. But I definitely don't prefer to do that. I want to be self-selected for at least some extent of the course. Um, No, we had a we we had a water issue with this light and it was a safety issue. I just wanted to it was making sure that it was actually taken care of. It doesn't look like it was. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you. Anybody have any safety issues? <laughs> have a good class. And then one of the other issues uh, that we take into account for group selection is we don't want too many people on the same stream within a group. So a group of engineering and society or three bioengineers and three management in the same group, uh, that's something we want to try and That's going to be a something. So the deadline, as I mentioned, is by this evening. Please fill out that questionnaire. And then the TAs and myself will use that information. We get it just generates a large spreadsheet and we can Any questions on that so far? Yes. Can you change your tutorial session on Monday? I already did. You did? Okay, I was told that it's not possible to change. Okay, so what, I, what I'll say then is the following. If anything has changed in the situation since you filled in the form, just fill in the form a second time. Uh, and then we'll, we'll uh, it just creates rows in the spreadsheet and I'll just pick the last row that you filled in. So if you've done it three or four times, don't worry. We'll, we'll pick the last one that shows up. But also, if you've made a mistake, or uh, because about 20 to 25 of you have already filled in the spreadsheet based on the information you've heard now, you might want to change your, your decisions, just uh, refill the form. Okay, so one other thing to realize with this course is because there's so much group work, uh, there's about 65% of this course is group work. So that's going to influence the final grade to a very large extent. If your group dynamics are not working well, 
you're going to be fairly frustrated that such a large portion of your brain can be influenced by, by the group. Okay. So you have to realize this. There are um, peer evaluations that will be used and applied. And this is totally up to you. So the peer evaluations, the way they work, you're familiar with it, is it modifies the new grade based on a, on a formula uh, on a journal publication uh, by some educational research that's taking place. And this modification will adjust grades up or down depending on group, relative group content. So there is a way to modify your grade based on the peer evaluation. Now in the past what I've seen is that most people say my peers all contributed 100%, so then the group grade isn't really modified. Now if, that, if that's true, that's fine. If it's not true, please don't feel pressurized to fill in an honest peer evaluation. Your peer evaluations are not seen by your peers, they're only seen by myself and the TAs. So there's no risk of putting in a negative evaluation on your peers. And it is it's brutal to say it, but it is a skill you need to learn. Because in companies, you're often asked by your manager, what, how are things going with so and so. Or you may be in the position where you need to fire one of your colleagues one day. And it will happen to some of you. Where, not that you get fired, I hope, but where you are in that position where you make that, those sorts of fairly brutal decisions based on other people's skills. Okay. So, what we're aiming for is, um, is to have projects where there's multiple checkpoints so there is opportunity to rectify things before they get out of hand. So don't wait. If things are not working out, you must communicate with your group. And if that's not working out, the TAs or myself need to get into start to get involved. And we'll form a group meeting and we'll discuss the issues that are going on. So please, please be aware of that. Um, no hitchhikers. There, my intention is the following. If you have a group member who is not contributed, or has contributed extremely little, oh, let's say, if they've not contributed at all, their name should not appear on the group submission. If their name appears on the group submission, that's a form of academic dishonesty for the names of the people who are on the submission. Okay, let's be clear about that. If someone has not contributed and you put their name on, and it turns out that they didn't contribute, and this becomes an issue later on, the other four people's names are, they're gonna be subject to academic dishonesty, okay? So please, please be aware of that, and that, um, that's an important point to understand. <clears throat> other forms of academic dishonesty that we need to be clear of is that sharing any materials between your groups is, not allowed under any circumstances. We have an issue where there are two, two tutorial slots, so it's quite easy for the group in the morning to share the material with the group in the afternoon and place them at an unfair advantage. And especially, it's, it's a bit self-defeatist if you do that because a lot of the tutorial material is self-directed learning. So if your group has gone and done the work of actually doing the learning in the morning and you hand it over to the group in the afternoon, you're removing that benefit. So, so please do not share any material between groups at all. And it's, and it's easy to share electronic material, even inadvertently people leave USB sticks behind the computers, leave documents open on computers. Um, but please just be aware of that. Okay, so to help ease some of the group issues, uh, you, you should be aware of, and I'm sure most of you are, about a number of very interesting document collaboration tools that are out there. How many people have used Google Docs to contribute in a group-based project? Okay, so you all know that you can edit the documents synchronously. Four, five, 20 people can even edit the document at the same time and work on it with no, with no issues. So make sure you do something like that. Uh, SkyDrive, Dropbox, whatever those tools that your group tends to prefer, please use those. Groups that are not in the same geographic location, please use tools like Skype and Messenger to collaborate. There's really no excuse to form an effective group um, these days. When I was in an undergraduate, obviously we, we didn't have things like this. It was paper and email and stuff. This is really, really nice to, to go ahead. 
Okay, so what we're going to discuss, um, not this next tutorial, but the tutorial the week after. So by next week, you will have your groups assigned. There may be some minor iteration on Monday, Tuesday, where we iron out some of the details once we announce the groups. There may be some, some conflicts that we need to resolve, but you'll pretty much have your groups established by very early next week. And then there'll be a responsibility for your group to meet outside lectures and tutorials and discuss your group norms. So this discussion on group norms, there will be a, a worksheet that you, your group goes through and you establish your ground rules that you're going to work with. You're going to be discussing what you will do as a group when a member is absent with excuse or is absent without an excuse. Um, you will be looking at how you handle disagreement. You'll be looking at the chairperson's role. So the chairperson will rotate through the group. There is usually one or two dominant people within a group, but you need to force that chairperson's role to rotate through different tutorials, different assignments, and in the project, um, that to chairperson's role needs to go through, through to a different person every time for them to learn those skills. Um, so how do you take on um, when someone's assigned the chairperson's role but they're really fearful of this position? And how are you going to deal with that? When there's someone with little motivation to work, um, when the work done is very uh, limited or uneven by one person, when you get people directly accusing and insulting face to face, that can, do, can dissolve, groups can dissolve into that very, very unhelpful situation. Rather, aim for constructive and helpful criticism. So how will you go about giving criticism to each other rather than blaming each other face to face? How are you going to, as a group, accept the case when your tutorial solution, uh, your tutorial end comes back to fail? Um, because the tutorials are graded pass fail. So how are you going to deal with that issue? And how are you going to avoid groupthink? So groupthink is where one of the person, one of the people in the group says, um, we need a packed column. Yeah, and then the other people think, well, no, I have I thought a tray, a tray column would work better here, but Okay, let's go for a pack column. So now you've got two people going for pack column. And then the other person, then neither here nor there, but then they just say pack column because they don't want to disrupt the group's flow. And then by the end, everyone has agreed on pack column, but meanwhile, there's been two or three people that really did think it needed to be a tray based installation column. So group think is where like, you form a herd and you just kind of go in one way without really even discussing it, based on maybe one dominant or two dominant people's decisions. How are you going to deal with that sort of scenario? You, you'll discuss this within your groups. Okay, so then just to end on the last few minutes here, uh, what we want you to achieve from 4N is other than learning about process economics, safety, and operating processes really well, you're going to learn skills and set goals. You will learn how to stand up and present your answers to the class. So in the tutorial session, at the end, every group will stand up and present one of the answers in the tutorial to the rest of the tutorial group. And that's going to be the solution that we um, will have. You'll learn to be a group chairperson. You'll learn hopefully to deal with a functional group that you may be in a dysfunction. So how do you handle that? Um, how do you go about finding these learning resources that you want to do for us? You'll be learning on economic data, how to find that data, how to interpret it. I will try to introduce some engineering ethics. Uh, I do I assume you have another engineering ethics course, but I will bring in some of the topics. Next, uh, we'll also learn about time management and project management in two tutorials from now. I'm going to try and get a guest speaker in about entrepreneurship and innovation and inventions and patents and so on, just to give you an idea of the general business sense of engineering. We're going to be extremely comfortable with engineering drawings by the end of this class. And then dealing with ambiguity and uncertainty is going to be a strong component. So, how do I go about figuring things out where I don't really know the temperature and pressure at which a distillation column is? How am I going to deal with figuring out and, and coming up to a best guess? And then some of the other skills that you've learned in 2G on communication, color letters, grammar, and spelling. So on that last point, I do want to emphasize the following. 
please go read the course outline. There's important information on cover letters and grammar and spelling is in tab one of that course handout. I will not be going through it in class, but I will be enforcing it at the next tutorial, and at least 20% of you are going to freak out because of that enforcement. Okay. Please go read that outline, and we will be enforcing the issue of cover letters and appropriate grammar and spelling very strongly in this course as a professional. Okay. So, see you next Monday at the tutorial.